Hello, my name is Claire Orbell and I'm the Registrar at Toy 2 Otago Settlers Museum. Welcome to the first of our new series titled Behind the Scenes, which will feature collection objects, conservation research and projects, and an insight into collection care and management. At this time of the year, in the lead up to Anzac Day on the 25th of April, museum staff would usually be preparing to welcome the public following the Anzac Day dawn service. On that morning, the museum would be bustling with visitors, warming themselves with hot drinks, enjoying a traditional Anzac biscuit, and sharing memories of their ancestors' military service. But in 2020, this traditional coming together of the Dunedin community for public commemoration is not possible as we continue our ongoing response to the COVID-19 virus. With that in mind, I have chosen to share with you today one of the many World War I objects from the collection of Toy 2 Otago Settlers Museum. This is one of six World War I signature quilts currently held at Toy 2. For those of you who visited our recent exhibitions, Dunedin's Great War and The Women's War, you will have had the opportunity to see several of these quilts on public display. Quilts of this kind were made by women's patriotic associations and other groups around New Zealand as a way of raising funds to support the war effort. While some examples were made on a single large piece of fabric, you can see that this quilt consists of a grid of white cotton squares. Historic records show that individual squares were sold to members of the public who wanted to record their names, often alongside patriotic messages and motifs. Their inscriptions were then embroidered onto the fabric. In most examples, this stitching was worked in red stranded cotton. The individual squares were then joined together and a white cotton border and backing was sewn in place to produce a quilt the size of a single bed. This particular quilt has a significant Dunedin starting point in its history. It was worked by women from the St. Clair Ladies Club in 1916. The club itself had been established two years earlier in 1914 by the minister of the St. Clair Presbyterian Church, Reverend James Miller. Among its aims, the club sought to actively work with the Red Cross and other societies to help the war effort, as well as providing companionship for women whose men were away at war. This quilt was worked as part of these fundraising efforts and sent overseas to the number one New Zealand General Hospital located at Brockenhurst in England. The site of this military hospital had been operating since 1914 as a temporary military hospital to treat Indian service personnel who had been injured in France. But in June 1916, the number one New Zealand General Hospital, previously located at Abisea in Egypt, was established on the site at Brockenhurst. You can see on this map that there were several other New Zealand military hospitals and convalescent facilities in the southern part of England. By the time of its closure at the end of January 1919, some 21,000 New Zealand troops had been treated there. This photograph shows a ward in the hospital at Brockenhurst and is one of many images taken by the Qualys Photo Company. While their photos are somewhat posed, they still provide an insight into the surroundings and conditions, the staff and patients, and the activities that took place. There is one photo in particular from this series, which I was amazed to come across while preparing this presentation. This image captures a moment in time inside what appears to be the hospital laundry room or linen store. Pegged on a line on the right side of the photo is a signature quilt. 
close inspection of the inscriptions and designs confirms that this is, in fact, the quilt made by the St. Clair Ladies Club, which is now held in our museum collection. The opportunity to see it in situ at the Brockenhurst Hospital brings its story to life and on another level. When this New Zealand Army Hospital was closed in 1919, a woman who worked there took the quilt home and placed it on her child's bed. Eventually, it went into storage, still in this family's care. 87 years later, in 2006, descendants of the family came out to New Zealand on holiday. Having previously established contact with the renamed St. Clair Women's Club, they handed the quilt back over to them at a ceremony in Queenstown. The club subsequently decided to donate the quilt to our museum. We had four other World War I signature quilts at the time and acquired another example in 2015, but they are increasingly rare to find. As part of preparing a selection of our patriotic quilts for display in the Dunedin's Great War and the Women's War exhibitions, the collections team took the opportunity behind the scenes to expand our cataloguing and photography of these objects. We were delighted to be able to work alongside two of our regular collection volunteers, Jan Wilson, seen here on the left, and Ingrid Emerson on the right. Both have been volunteers at the museum for many years, and as members of the Otago Embroiderers Guild, their expertise was invaluable for the Signature Quilt project. For each individual square on all the signature quilts held in the collection, they painstakingly recorded the inscriptions and motifs, the threads used, and the type of embroidery stitches worked. As a result, we now have complete information about the contributors to the quilts, as well as materials and techniques used. In closing, I would like to share close-ups of three of the entertaining graphic motifs and verses that are included on the St. Clair Ladies Club quilt that we've been featuring today. This square is the contribution of Nell Karuthi, from Q in Dunedin. Her cockerel lends itself nicely to the accompanying verse, keep crowing, a bird in the hand is worth two on the quilt. My second selection is this square worked by Pearl Murray from St. Clair in Dunedin. Her depiction of a slightly unusual looking oversized kiwi on the run with a German soldier in its mouth is certainly lively, with the soldier's pickle helper helmet falling to the ground in the bustle of action. And finally, this square by Mary Lynn of St. Clair has a rousing image of the British bulldog, used during World War I as a patriotic representation for the British war effort, beating a drum. The inscription above makes reference to the song written by Patrick Gilmore, when Johnny comes marching home again. Thank you for joining me to take a closer look at one of our much treasured World War I signature quilts. I encourage you to gather together in your bubbles on Anzac Day and remember those who sacrificed so much during another global period of crisis. If you've enjoyed this presentation, please keep an eye out for future episodes. We look forward to sharing more stories from behind the scenes at Toitu.